we go over to you, Professor Aparna Rayaprol. Uh, Aparna is professor and former head, Department of Sociology, Central University of Hyderabad. Her areas of interest include gender studies, Indian diaspora, qualitative research methods, and urban sociology. She was the director of the Study, India Pro Study in India program for five years at the university and was associated with it since its inception in 1998. And she has been closely involved with its academic and as well as administrative responsibilities. Professor Ayaprol, there have been some questions asking whether uh, some of the speakers can address the conditions within countries like in India. Mm -hmm. So maybe your uh, 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 talk, your presentation could take that on as well. So over to you. Thank you, Professor Kamala Ganesh. And thank you to GRFDT, especially Sadanand Sahu, for inviting me to speak uh, on this very important subject. Uh, thanks also to Amba Pandey uh, for being here and starting off the proceedings. Uh, well, I think uh, my task has become a little more easier, primarily because the for other two speakers have kind of laid some foundations for understanding this entire kind of invisibility. So let me uh, start off with why is the focus on gender and migration that you want us to actually talk about? And of course, um, I will uh, look at the Indian context. Some of the heartbreaking images in the past few weeks of the spread of the pandemic in India are of the working class woman. Is my voice clear? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It is clear. Yeah. 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 Of the working class woman with the child on her back walking miles to reach her native village as the place of work which has become her home has either asked her to go back or left her with few resources to survive. And upon reaching her quote unquote home, she got sprayed on with disinfectant in a most insensitive manner or got locked up in quarantine. This scenario seems to connote a generalized condition of homelessness. Her home does not want to welcome her back just in case she's carrying the virus of development of the dangers of the big city, while the city for those whose perennial development she and her family gave their sweat and tears and wants her to go back as there is literally no space for outsiders like her to stay and maintain physical distance. The current global health crisis compels us to turn the lens back on the struggles and insecurities of migration and settlement. So dependent migration has been the lens, the axis around which a lot of of the research on migration gender has been done. And I think uh, for decades, women have been kind of classified as dependent migrants. And it is, uh, you know, very strange that they have been classified as dependents, as in many, many contexts, they are, in fact, the primary breadwinners, the homemakers, they are the everything. So in the Indian context, you know, whether you take the domestic worker who has move from a scenario of having come as a migrant construction laborer to uh, moving to either a dog worker, come car cleaner, come domestic worker, to moving to a cook. I'm talking about small but certain kind of upward mobility in a context in the home of probably another migrant of a middle class. You know, so we have these layers of migration, women employed by women and urban women employers who are actually working to uh, want these women uh, who are working for them. The care economy is definitely the place which is extremely gendered, as both uh, Professor Roberts and Ambassador said, have eloquently told us uh, in both contexts. Now, if we look at the care economy, we are talking of the domestic workers who include the child care and I don't think anyone has mentioned, so I will, the large elder care givers that are there, in, especially in our Indian cities. We have an aging population about whom the current virus is making us worry about because they are more vulnerable, but we have a population of 
domestic workers, mostly female. You know, the care economy again prefers to have a female worker inside the home rather than a male worker. So the focus on gender and migration in all directions and in all its multi layers and intersectionalities sees poor, often Dalit or Muslim women who are the caregivers and the ones who are completely invisibilized. So if they are so invisibilized, how are we able to, uh, you know, look at them and see them? So one of the things is, you know, the way we do our research, the way we collect our data and why is our, as academics, we also need to see that we don't invisibilize the worker. Who is this worker and how are we able to do it? You know, one of my students had done a study in Nagaland on street vendors. And some of these women had actually said, why do I need a bank account? So what do you do was asked. And they said, no, we sell these perishables. And at the end of the day, we are the ones who have to take home. And they are, of course, migrants to Dimapu. And uh, they say, what is the man doing? And it is actually nothing. So what is the meaning of nothing? He's just lying. He's addicted. So whether it's alcohol or drug, you know, there is a burden of the male addict who is supposedly the prime earner in our data, in our statistics, who is completely taking over because psychologically and ideologically, he is still the head of the family. In that sense, how are we able to, you know, turn the lens? How are we able to actually look at some of these women who are in effect the primary earners, but the most vulnerable? And as uh, Kamala ji has pointed out a little earlier, I think we also need to understand the violent circumstances in which they live. Today, with the crisis where everyone is at home, where they cannot and you know, it's impossible for them to maintain the social distance, which privileged people like us are able to maintain. And in that situation, men without work, and as studies have shown us over the last century, it's the men without work who become the most violent in these circumstances. So it's a double whammy of sorts that is there. The second point that I will uh, address, of course, is what are the fe feminist agendas? Well, the biggest feminist agenda is to make visible the invisible. And to how do public places become much more uh, friendly to the women migrant workers? Let's start with the very basic. You know, there have been documentaries like Paramita Vora's q to p that has looked at our nation's capital and uh, Bombay and Delhi, both as places where we have not been able to actually um, provide basic facilities, no toilets for women. So that is uh, going on, I think, um, in a situation where these women are completely um, unwelcome in these public faces. So sanitation, healthcare, primary. I think that is where we need to uh, talk about. We need to talk about uh, public health facilities where these people can go in. Several of these women, when they are pregnant, are not able to go in and get themselves tested. And when they go into pregnancy and childbirth, when they come back, they lose their job or they go a notch lower. So a downward social mobility is again very, very gender. If you look at who who is the one who is most vulnerable and who uh, in the stratification ladder, it is the poor Dalit Muslim women. You know, so we need to understand that in, in today's world, the feminist agenda is really to make, uh, you know, visible the invisible. To also look at the large amount of remittances, say somebody mentioned the, you know, I was looking at the questions on the side and somebody was talking about the nurses in Kerala. And if nurses in Kerala are the ones we are talking about, if we look at the remittances that they have given, I don't think it will be very, very different from the Filipina case where the, the women are the ones who are really the backbone of the nation's economy in Philippines. So I think we need to understand, and like Saskia Sassen said a couple of decades ago, um, the nannies, maids, these are the ones who, whether they cross borders that are international, 
or national or local so we have rural to urban we have rural to small town we have small town to urban we have national to international so i think the indian context today is very very um, shaky as far as migrants are concerned whether it's male or female whether it's the taxi worker who uh, is the aggregate taxi the uber ola uh, the male migrant who is completely you know uh, dependent now probably on his domestic worker mother again uh, for his survival and uh, you know had the tables turned again or did the tables never turn was she always the one who was supporting the family and supporting the economy so i think one needs to not just add women but you know look at it from the centrality of gender and of course within the larger intersectionalities i think i'll stop for now if that's okay and then take up the questions a little later yeah thank you thank you very much uh, dr rai prol uh, i think you took on uh, took on straight the very important point of what kind of categories we use we as researchers or as reporters that we also assume certain categories which make women invisible and i think your question of uh, you are uh, using this term dependent how this dependent is used for women when they are they might have gone there initially as dependents but they soon get into the economy so they are also part of the economy and how we unthinkingly use the word male breadwinner where the male may not be winning the bread and the woman would be doing some at least half the bread half the loaf of bread she would be bringing so the importance of making the invisible visible is actually the agenda of uh, feminism and we see that even in such a thing as a covid 19 uh, uh, situation there is a lot of gendered impact and uh, so policy has to be sensitive of course you might say now what can we do besides lockdown and social distancing even if it brings it even if it brings special problems to women do you have an option this kind of question the answer is that response to the situation even within a lockdown or within social distancing can have a particular focus on the most vulnerable which are actually migrant poor women so thank you for uh, for that presentation